want to introduce you to, to someone uh, this morning, John Schaffner. John, why don't you come on up here? Uh, John is uh, here this weekend, if you have called, to become our next associate pastor for University Life. And uh, this really began, John, man, we've been at this a long time, back in uh, December. And uh, John had a great many uh, commitments through the spring, just things we, uh, obligations we wanted him to be able to uh, fulfill. But uh, we were anxious, uh, very anxious for him to get in front of you before the uh, semester is uh, over. And uh, John's here with his uh, family. And uh, John, why don't you go ahead and introduce Amy. Sure. And this is my beautiful wife, Amy. Amy, you wanna stand up and wave? <laughs> we actually met um, involved in a campus ministry at Louisiana Tech. So we're a campus ministry family story. My son, Jack, Jack, you wanna wave at everybody? Jack was born down in South Louisiana when we were doing campus ministry there. Sadie, Sadie, you wanna wave? She's eight and she was born in Calgary, Alberta. She's a dual Canadian citizen. So. All right. Well, we've asked, uh, we asked them to be in all three services uh, today to be introduced so that all the church family can have an opportunity to, uh, to meet them. And we want to do this on the front end of the service because uh, I don't know if uh, Sadie and Jack are going to try to go to Sunday school, that sort of thing uh, this morning. But I uh, wanted you to have a chance to, to just get a glimpse into, uh, into John's heartbeat and really what uh, created such an interest for us and what really captured uh, our attention. And, and a part of it is, is what, what really uh, kind of piqued my interest is John is a later in life uh, convert and uh, you know, grew up in church and that sort of thing. And, uh, but, but John, give us a little uh, synopsis of what really brought you to that point of conversion and commitment. Well, I was raised in South Arkansas in a religious environment. My mom was a committed Christian, one of the strongest Christians I've ever been around to this day, but I never, it never really hit my heart and hit home for me. I had this good old boy religiosity, this Bible belt, churchianity, and I would have called myself a Christian long before I actually met Christ. And so I did a lot of things in high school that I, man, I wish I could go back and do over again. I accumulated a lot of regrets in a relatively short period of time, and it took a tragedy for me to realize my lostness for God to get my attention. And so I was 18 and bulletproof, right? I was gonna live forever. And then one night I was out partying with some friends like I'd done a hundred times before. And we were drinking and I was driving and I was going into town looking for some guys that we were supposed to fight. And uh, that's my last memory. I ended up having a bad wreck that night and my cousin was killed instantly, 16 years old. And everything I'd built my life on, you know, athletics, popularity, the girl I was dating, the vehicle I was driving, everything disintegrated in that moment on the side of the road. It could not hold the weight of the tragedy that I was in the middle of. And it was in the days after that, that Jesus found me. And I thought it was, I thought Christianity was for people that didn't get invited to the parties. I thought it was nice for old people to give them something to do. But, but I, I found out firsthand that it is real, like it's for everybody, that Jesus is alive and it changed everything. Like he went shoulder deep into the ditch and he found me and he saved me and all things became new for me. And so that's, that's where it all got started for me. John, be, that happening and that, uh, that dramatic as that was that moment, tell me how that, uh, and, and tell our students, how did that, uh, how that kind of defines who you are, your passion for ministry, the urgency that you have sure. uh, for, for evangelism and reaching people. Well, having a, a, a later conversion like that, especially such a dr dramatic, like Damascus Road, man, 180, I was going this way, and then, you know, God pulled the e-brake, and all of a sudden, I'm going the other way. I still remember what it feels like to be lost. And I'm telling you, I, I did not know that this whole subculture existed. You know, there were youth groups in Camden, they were doing their retreats and their weekly meetings and their disciple nows and their worship times, but I, that was not on my radar. And for them to somehow hope that I was gonna stumble into their chapel and ask about Jesus, uh, that was hoping far too much in my life. And so what I needed as an 18 year old guy that wasn't interested in God, I would have claimed to believe in him, I needed somebody to come into my world. I needed somebody on that football team that was committed to Christ, that was gonna go beyond the Wednesday night worship moment and live it out in the hallways of our high school. I needed somebody that was gonna connect with me in my world rather than expect me to come into theirs. And so I take that, I really wanna connect with students that are not yet here. The students that would not set their alarm on a Sunday morning. And so that's my heart. My heart is for people that aren't here yet and as they make the most important decisions of their life, they're gonna set the trajectory for their journey in these next few years. I believe every person is created by God to accomplish something significant, but it's also possible to miss it. 
It's possible to make the most important decisions of your life without seeking God. And it's my objective um, to, to go into their world and to meet them on their turf and to have those Jesus conversations with these people that never would come and find us. So there's 32,611 souls at Texas Tech University, just a few blocks down the street, and as well as the other campuses that are here in town. And the vast majority of those students aren't gonna come find us. They're spiritually flatlined. So they, a spiritually dead person is not gonna make worship a priority. So what does that mean if they don't come to us? We have to go to them. We have to leave this place, leave the locker room, go out onto the field and interact with people that would never find us. And so that's my heartbeat. You see John's uh, passion and zeal and why we were drawn to him. And he brings a fresh voice and a fresh uh, vision and uh, energy for our university uh, minister. Whenever we call staff, ministerial staff, we don't impose upon them <clears throat> a template of, uh, of how they're supposed to lead, of, uh, of trying to continue something and say, uh, you know, they don't, our staff doesn't get a spill when they come here about, well, this is the way we've always done it. Uh, we, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the facilitator of change and he brings people into the life of our church because they do have fresh eyes and fresh vision. And uh, John, it's with great enthusiasm that we look forward to uh, the giftedness that God has given to you and uh, the unfolding of your vision that you have. Which brings me to the last question, why First Baptist Lubbock? Oh, that's a great question. I tell you, it's a privilege to be here. And it wasn't like I was desperately you know, wanting to leave where we're at in Arkansas. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we've never been happier than where we're at right now doing campus ministry, a great place for my family. But then Scott Carlin, who's on staff here, uh, called me and that kind of got the ball rolling, which by the way, Scott is my former campus minister. And so I, was pretty, I think it's pretty incredible that now I get to serve with Scott as a college minister. Um, but that got the ball rolling for me and we've never experienced a clearer call. It is an incredibly strong call from God to move here to Lubbock and to join God in what he's already doing here. You got a staff um, that is a dream team staff here to work with. The, the more that I hang out with them, the more I like them. And one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle for me was when I came out here and heard your pastor, heard his heart for the church and his missional vision for ministry, which was, an, uh, my, my heart lines up extremely well under Bobby's leadership. And that was a big component for me. And so God called us here, but also, I mean, there are not many churches anywhere that have the college program that First Baptist has. Now, you may not realize that because you're here, maybe you've always been here and you don't know what's going on outside of here, but it's a privilege to be a part of a ministry like this. This is a rare church that values college students on this level. So for me as a college minister, it's really a dream job to get to come here and serve with a staff like this and serve with a ministry like this and serve with life group leaders that are incredible. These life group leaders could, could be college ministers in other churches, but yet they're sacrificially serving here. So all the components are here for God to do some pretty incredible things. All right, John, you can see uh, he's going to be a wonderful addition. Our staff has spent a great deal of time uh, with him, and uh, we already love uh, John and Amy and Sadie and Jack, and we're look, looking forward to them arriving here probably the first week in June, something like that is what we're uh, looking at, and uh, if everything works out logistically for, for him and uh, his family. Uh, I said that was the last question, one other one, I guess. Have you all seen the movie 300? You ever, anybody ever say you look like Leonidas? Uh, about once a week. There you go. Uh, That's what I thought. I told my wife, if we have another son, I'm going to name him Sparta. So when we, whenever we walk in, I introduce him, I can say, this is Sparta. Uh, <laughs> no? Okay. That was what jumped out at me the first time I met him. I said, man, we're, we're getting Leonidas. <laughs> Pretty cool. All right, John, thank you. We appreciate you guys being here. I know y'all want to get out and walk around a little bit and maybe take you to Sunday school and that sort of thing. All right, thank you guys. Let's, let's have a word of prayer and thank God for uh, his, his diligent provision and uh, we'll continue in worship. Our Father, how grateful we are that you are a God who provides, that, that when we are faithful and uh, patient and diligent, that you're a God who, who proves faithful time and time again. I thank you for, for John and for, for Amy for Sadie and Jack and their safe travels here. And Lord, the, the call that you have placed upon their life to, to be your, your servants and servants of your church and, and how grateful we are for the way that in, in your provision, you have intersected our lives together. And uh, Lord, just uh, the excitement and the enthusiasm of all the things that you have in store for us in our community and around the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.